forward to connecting with you on the Zoom Connect time that will happen after that. Take care. We're on our way towards summer. Isn't that good news? Good morning, everyone. Welcome, as the others have welcomed you already to our online services here at Grace Point, a new way of doing things. I want to just uh, extend a very warm welcome to those who are, are not normally part of the, the Grace Point family. So if you're new to Grace Point, especially to you, uh, we love the fact that you're joining us uh, to, today. So we're busy with Justice Month, and uh, for Justice Month today, I'm going to be reading from Lamentations chapter 3. Now, to be honest with you, I haven't preached much from Lamentations, but it is really an incredible book to read from. Lamentations chapter 3, from verse 22 to 24. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. That is God's word. I want you just for a moment to imagine Jeremiah in this moment. He's sitting in a cave and he's looking over Jerusalem. The setting is not good. Jerusalem, this one beautiful, once beautiful, prideful city, was laying in ruins. It was completely decimated. I want you for a moment to imagine this beautiful city, and I've had the privilege of being to Jerusalem, this beautiful city with a working economic system where everything was vibrant. It was a vibrant life, vibrant family life. But somehow, Israel had turned away from God. And as they turned away from God, as they neglected to do what God commanded them to do, so the city was attacked, and it was a mess. Jeremiah the prophet went up and escaped and was sitting in this cave, and as he's writing this lamentation, he's looking over the city of Jerusalem, this once beautiful, prideful city, now destroyed, literally wrecked. And ruin. And as he looks over the city, he sees a few things. He sees a smoldering buildings. He sees devastation. He sees hungry and poor people. He smells the stench. There is a stench of death over the city as people die of disease and starvation. It must have been a very terrible, an absolutely terrible sight to imagine the city before to what the city was now. A lot of it, all of it, is because of the people of Israel's rejection of God's commands, of God's ways. And so ultimately, Jerusalem turned on itself and was devastated. And Jeremiah is sitting in this cave, this prophet, lamenting over what he sees the mess of a city lying before him. And so the tragedy, as far as he's concerned, could have been averted as he sits in the cave and and smells the stench of decaying bodies, as he sees poor, starving people literally poking through the rubble, this once proud nation is now broken. He keeps on telling us that this tragedy could have been averted. He warned the people to repent and to seek God. He warned people to turn away from their wicked ways and to seek, find God. And all he got from them was mocking and imprisonment, beating and rejection. And despite Jeremiah's warnings, They continued to rebel against God until it was too late. If only they listened. We have a tradition here at Grace Point of of in July, and it feels like we've been speaking about justice issues for quite a while now. But it just so happens that Justice Month every month is uh, every year every month in the year July we commit 
to issues of justice. But I'm wondering if we ourselves have heeded our own warnings, our own teachings. I'm wondering how many justice months we're going to need to go through as a church and as a community before something takes traction. In case you haven't noticed, we, you and I, like Jeremiah, look upon a city in ruins. Now in suburbia, it might not look that ruined. In suburbia, things might still look okay. But beyond that, friends, there is death and decay. The smoldering ruins of our community and of our city have to break every Christ follower's heart. And we continuously hear from God. And what, what stage, I wonder, do we get to a place where we hear God? Now, I don't want to for a moment discount the many people who are doing incredibly good work, handing out parcels, um, dealing with communities, uh, feeding communities, going into places that they would not normally go in to be able to bring God's love and compassion into communities. But yet we still find ourselves looking at a city of death and destruction. This could have been averted. And so as I sit in the cave here today, there's so many things that I see that I think must be breaking God's heart. And just as Jeremiah looked upon the smoldering ruins of Jerusalem, we look at the smoldering ruins of our own communities. We continue to look at the issues of racism in our own country. And yes, as a church, we have struggled and spoken and debated around issues of racism, of systemic racism, of Black Lives Matter. And even despite our speaking around these issues, we continuously to have a revolt from some people who are saying, no, you don't understand, Gary, all lives matter. We keep on hearing defensism, defenses around systemic racism. We keep on hearing people say, but Gary, I wasn't part of apartheid. I was, I was not part of it. I wasn't even born then. But yet we still find ourselves in this place of tragedy where we, where we refuse to, to own our privilege and to own the advantage that we have. Can I ask you, how's that worked for you? A continuous defense. You see, until you and I get to a place of understanding our creation and that we are created in the image of God and that we're okay with who we are as God's people, you cannot, black or white, male or female, change who you are, but you can make a difference in the lives that need support and help and, and rallying with against issues of racism, systemic racism. The smoldering rules of gender-based violence have been absolutely devastating, absolutely devastating. As our mothers, our grandmothers, our daughters, our, our sisters, our grandchildren are continuously abused, beaten, raped, abducted, and used as sex topics, objects. I was reading just yesterday of someone called Nandi who spoke about her life and what it meant for her. And I'm wanting to just read just the last part of, of what she said in her letter. It was entitled, My Name is Nandi. Can you see me now? If you're a follower of mine on Facebook, you can read the article. It's absolutely devastating. And Nandi explains how she uh, fell pregnant uh, during uh, lockdown. 
and how her employer told her that it would not be good for her uh, as a pregnant woman to be working in their house. Even although Nandi was told all the time, Nandi, you like family. Nandi, you're part of the family. And so her employer let her go until she had the baby. She speaks about how she stands in the queue for UIF, her ankles swollen, hungry and tired, and the official just laughs. Your madam hasn't been pay paying UIF, the official tells her. And so she carries this, the, the, the baby until ultimately she gives birth. She waits for her taxi to get to the maternity clinic and home again. Then she uses her last 16 rand, her last 16 rand, to get there. But then she has to start walking home. The labor pains gripping her body. She walks through the streets like a ghost, holding this tiny human in her. Ultimately, when it becomes too much and the labor pangs become unbearable, she then walks seven kilometers to the hospital. I turn around and start, walk, start walking back. It's only seven kilometers. I can do this one step at a time. Only seven kilometers, Nandi. Keep going. She gets to the hospital she has her baby in the corridors of the hospital. And as she says, baby Nati comes bursting into this world right here on the floor of the clinic. In the chaos while this world keeps turning right in front of my fellow laboring sisters, right in front of the security guard who is eating his afternoon snack. I'm embarrassed and I'm confused. And so she says, no longer does my body look like the tower of shame, which it has been for the last three months. And then ultimately holding baby Nati, she walks the seven kilometers home amidst the wolf whistles of the men around her. She wonders if these men even see the baby and the fact that she has just recently given birth. And so she walks and she says, my body hurts. Why is there still blood? Seven kilometers, keep walking. She gets home. And everything was exactly the same. She says to herself, the world doesn't stop for you, sissy. You're not the only one, the first person to have a baby. Keep going. Gogo needs her medicine. I put some pup on the fire for us both. And baby Nati doesn't make a sound. I keep him strapped tightly to me while I work. And then in the midst of that, on her first night home, he comes back. The man from the corner, he wants something from me. And so I hide, I hide baby Nutty in a fruit box in the corner and he takes what he wants from me. My body feels split in two. He's a good man, but the drink just makes him come, become angry sometime. He's cross tonight and he wants me to remember. And so I stifle my tears and baby Nutty screeches for food. I'm scared. You're a mother now, Nandi. Suck it up. And so she concludes and says, for the next few days, baby Nati cries and I cry, and baby Nati cries and I cry. And the missus's, my madam's words echo in my head. You knew this could happen, Nandi. Now you must take responsibility for your actions. If only she knew. My name is Nandi. I left baby Nati in a fruit box outside the police station. The world is looking for me now. They want to send me to jail. They want to crucify me. If he kills me tonight, will the world look for him? My name is Nandi. I abandoned my baby. And now the world sees me. Our community is in ruins. Because you see, Nandi's story is like hundreds, maybe even thousands of other people's stories. Of that there is no doubt. And the issue is this, this tragedy could have been avoided. He warned people to repent and seek God, but all they did was abandon, was mock him and imprison him. 
And so the city is lying in ruins. And friends, I'm wondering what it is that you and I are going to do to rebuild our community and to rebuild our city. What is it going to take for you and me to take to the streets and say to our government, enough is enough. How much longer will our members of parliament and councillors steal food parcels? How much longer will we allow our, our, our sasa to be corrupted by government officials? What is it going to take for us to stand up for people like Nandi and baby Nati, who we don't know where, is right, where she is right now? When are we going to take to the streets? Because we know where the councillors live. We know where they are stealing food parcels. We know where the money is going. How is it that 21 municipalities in this whole country of ours, over, of over 200 municipalities, that only 21 can get a clean audit? When is that going to be enough? When is it going to be enough when we're going to allow big corporations to underpay their staff and to treat staff? When are we going to stop the suburban uh, uh, husband and wife from not paying a basic salary for people who work in their homes and to not pay UIF for their staff? When is it going to be enough? When are we going to be able to say, I should be allowed to ask my daughter to please go to the local spa at seven o'clock at night to buy Coke for the family that I can send her or she can volunteer to walk down to the local spaza. And by the way, not even talk about the fact that someone might give a wolf whistle or, or call out some sexual innuendo or invite her or rape her or abduct her. Because you know why? We live in an abnormal society. Friends, we are sick. And the sickness, by the way, please hear me, and this is ju just this month, the sickness before you get all excited and, and mournful and want to lament, the sickness, friends, just, isn't just seen in the acts of racism, beating, violence, rape, and murder. That is not where the, where the, where the, where the only issue is. The issue is on the other divide where, when you and I sit back and do nothing about it. And in some ways, and I'm sorry to say this, in some ways, if we sit back and do nothing and all we do is click our tongues and shake our heads and, and make some whatever feeble excuse that we have, we are just as bad as the perpetrators. Let's own that. I'm the first to say to you today, I am a recovering racist. I know that. I know that I've got issues of prejudice that I have to deal with in my life. And I'm a recovering racist. I'm a recovering abuser. And I have to deal with that. I'm a recovering capitalist that thinks that rich people just got what they deserve because they worked hard for it and so it belongs to them. But Jeremiah comes in here and he says, there's a cure for this. We have to somehow not only look around us, but we have to look up. We have to be able to look to God and in God we can find hope, but not if it's just in theory, not even if it's a spiritual act or understanding. And so he puts new thoughts in his mind. He allows what he sees to break him. He allows what he sees, the rubble, the people looking through for food and the stench of death, he allows that to absolutely break him. But the key is he stops thinking about himself and he looks to God. He stops thinking it's all about him and his focal and focus point comes, points to God. He thinks about God. You see, because quite frankly, thinking about yourself is actually quite depressing, to be honest. If you and I are just fixated by, by, by thinking about ourselves, let me tell you something, it's bad for you. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually. If you are on the beginning and end of who you are and your life, it's a bad place to be. Thinking about God is always encouraging. 
But Jeremiah allows this to break his heart because he's seeing humanity through the lens of who God is. And so he looks to God and he says to God, yes, if it wasn't for your mercy, I should be consumed today. I should not even be existing today. You should have smited me a long time ago, God, because I have rebelled against you. And me, like Israel, has turned our back on God. Maybe not in word, but in action. And so he turns his focus and he says, God, yes, because of your mercy, I'm alive today and today is a gift. And so everything I have comes from you and it is a gift. I don't deserve what I have. But God, in your loving mercy, you have shown loving kindness to me. It says that his compassions fail not. And Jeremiah looks at God and says, you know what? God has not stopped loving me even although, quite frankly, I'm unlovable. But God never stops loving you and me. He has compassion. His mercies are new every morning. He says, God, you are faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. God was faithful to warn people of what not to do. God was faithful to do what he warned. But even more, God was faithful to love us and show compassion to us. And ultimately, he finishes off and speaks about the Lord is my portion. The Lord is my portion. And this is what I want to end off with today. Is God enough for you? Jeremiah comes to this place and he says, God is all I need. And so he realizes that he will continue to be tortured he realized he'll continue to be mocked. He realized that he will continue to be imprisoned and ultimately die. But God is enough. And what God is calling us to do is to live lives as fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And yes, to respond as Jesus would respond in all of these situations. That we would look beyond ourselves and that we would declare that, God, yes, you are enough. I will not find fulfillment in riches. I will not find fulfillment in power. I will not find fulfillment in anything else but you, God. Is God enough for you? Is God enough to save our country? Is God enough to right the wrongs? Is God enough to help heal me of my racism? My sense of male privilege and white privilege. Is God enough to heal me of that? I believe he is for me and for you. As he was for Jeremiah. And so because I look at God, even amongst the smoldering ruins, I see a tiny gra a green leaf of grass growing out of the smoldering ruins. I see color. Even though it may be faint, I see signs of new life amongst the smoldering ruins. But it is there because God is enough to heal our country, to heal our continent, to heal our world, and to heal you, and to heal me. Let us pray. And so God, we thank you that you are with us and that you love us. I thank you, Lord God, for having compassion on us, even although we do not deserve it. Be with us, gracious God, today, in our lives, in our community. We invite your Spirit to continuously nudge us to pass on your compassion and love. In the name of Jesus, who is our Savior, amen. Friends, as I conclude now, I want to invite you to please read 
Nandi's story. Um, if you are a follower of mine on Facebook, um, you'll see it under my feed from yesterday. Uh, but I really want to invite you to please uh, go and read Nandi's story. It's, as I said, it's on my Facebook page and on my Facebook, um, whatever it's called. Um, so please want you go and check it out uh, and read it. And my prayer is that God's heart, God will stir your heart of compassion. May God be with you. Amen.